Good morning. Now you can. Did everyone enjoy the tango last night? Yay. I thought we would maybe take a moment to thank Catherine, uh, Natalie, Adrian, um, and Kirsty. I don't know if you had a sense of probably how hard that was logistically to get us all over there. So if you wouldn't mind uh, thanking them. It was a lot of fun. I still have the music going in my head. Um, we won't be doing performative dance for you, though, I promise. So I'm Maureen Kelly. Uh, I'll be the chair of the session uh, this morning in two case studies on communicable diseases. Um, I'm at the Ethox Center with Mike Parker and uh, Population Health at, at Oxford. I'm really, really happy to be here and, and so excited that this theme was chosen. Uh, it's a topic that's really close to my heart. Uh, so just to set up the cases, and uh, thank you, Paul and Tech, for bringing together a lot of the themes that have come out of the, of the uh, sessions so far, and I'll echo a few of those to set up these two case studies. Um, we're going to be focusing on uh, infectious disease and, and encouraging you to think about what, if anything, is special or unique about infectious disease. And we have an opportunity to think in particular about the history of HIV research uh, in surrounding pregnant women particularly. So in 1994, French researchers discovered that AZT was effective in uh, reducing, significantly reducing vertical transmission of HIV from mom to baby. And it ushered in a wave of two decades of research on pregnant women it's probably the single example of the most sort of robust attempt to do research with pregnant women. Now the current thinking on PMTCT is very holistic. It doesn't just focus on preventing HIV transmission to the baby, it does focus on preventing HIV in the mom. It starts upstream and looks holistically at efforts to prevent HIV first. It looks at robust approaches to ANC, to antenatal care. It looks at the issue of transmission and biological transmission, but then it also looks at follow-up efforts uh, with support and counseling for breastfeeding and strategies for breastfeeding. But nonetheless, think about it. I mean, this massive wave of research really has been driven in large part, despite that holistic approach, by our concerns about the baby, not so much about concerns about the mom. If there are concerns about the mom, it's tended to be more indirect. And I think it's really important just to recognize this, that we have huge numbers and huge effort of uh, involving pregnant women in research. We have an opportunity to learn how that's been done, how consent's been done, et cetera. The two case studies today look at a new wave of research on PrEP. So this is pre-exposure prophylaxis to HIV. It's a really interesting example, and I think a contrast to PMTCT. So pre-exposure pre-exposure prophylaxis is looking at different strategies, both um, chemoprophylaxis and microbicides that can be used to prevent the transmission of HIV in non-infected individuals. Now it's really interesting in the case of pregnant women uh, and the clinical trials that have been done and the different types of um, PrEP strategies, a lot of those studies, a clinical trial stage, didn't include pregnant women or dropped women once they became pregnant in the study. Nonetheless, there's still data on efficacy in pregnancy because with tenofovir and other interventions, it's been used as treatment, right? It hasn't been used as prevention, but it's been used as treatment. So we do have data on safety in pregnancy. Despite that, when we flip to evaluating it as prevention of HIV to the woman when she's pregnant, they're suddenly being dropped from the trials and we're concerned about the sensitivity of including pregnant women in research. So why is that? It's very interesting asymmetry, ethical asymmetry and scientific asymmetry given the data we have on safety. So it's an interesting case study to reflect on. It's obviously medically more complex than I've laid out, but I just wanted to, to present that somewhat provocatively as a contrast. Um, the two case studies that we have are also really good examples of empirical ethics research that have been, it's been both um, social science studies on the ethical issues surrounding the inclusion of pregnant women in PrEP, um, PrEP studies have been, um, have supported 
social science research. So these clinical trials and the researchers behind them have really struggled with this question of inclusion of pregnant women. So for both of the big demonstration projects, they're now at the stage where they have clinical data on efficacy of PrEP for preventing HIV. It's a really promising tool, particularly when you think about the microbicides, not just the, um, the chemoprophylaxis. It's another potential tool for women and a complement or possibly alternative to asking a man to wear a condom. It's something that the woman controls. It's something that she doesn't have to wait on somebody else to take care of. So it has a lot of potential um, benefits for women and for women during pregnancy. And the population with the highest risk of transmission continues to be young women um, of childbearing age and young pregnant women. Um, so it, it's an exciting opportunity, and yet we're at the stage where countries are considering rolling out PrEP, Kenya, Uganda, for example, and we don't have that data on safety and efficacy in pregnancy necessarily because they were dropped from the studies. So we now have small cohorts with the two studies that are represented here that are following pregnant women who decided to remain on PrEP when they became pregnant. Um, and so both of, both of our presenters will be talking about the ancillary social science work that was done while these demo projects were going on asking some of these ethical questions. So I encourage you to think about the questions that um, Paul laid out um, and tech this, this question, the continuing theme of the cross-cultural challenges. And I think both of the case studies highlight some of the issues that have come up uh, previously, and particularly with um, Dr. Ngure's study, the role of partners. What role should partners play in this decision to enroll pregnant women when you might have imperfect trial data, but you're getting ready to roll out or implement a new intervention? Um, secondly, how do we think about how this data should be shared with women at this implementation stage of science? with a potentially new intervention or the adaption of an intervention that's been proven effective in another context and is now being proposed for use in pregnant women, again, with imperfect data. How do you communicate to that woman? And how do women and partners and others make that decision? So those are just some questions to get you, you thinking about some of the issues. So let me go ahead and introduce our first presenter. Um, Dr. Kristen Sullivan is project director at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Center for Bioethics, and she's the director of the Phases Project. Uh, this is a four-year NIH-funded, multi-institutional, international research project addressing ethical, legal, and scientific considerations around involving pregnant women in research. 